Hey, today I'll be talking about book six of Legend of Jun Huan. We start off with a banquet, Jun Huan getting drunk and leaving, and Lan Yi confronting her with a knife. Huan Bi spits in Lan Yi's face, not in defense of Jun Huan, but just to tell her scornfully that she is not worthy of Xuan Qing. Xuan Qing shows up and tells Lan Yi that if she hurts Jun Huan, he will disregard their previous friendship. Lan Yi sighs, realizing he really does love her, and Jun Huan leaves with an awkward but polite goodbye. Jun Huan's sisters, Yu Rao and Yu Yao, come to visit her. They are now 15 and 20. The 15-year-old Yu Rao is the one you know and love from the drama, while the 20-year-old Yu Yao is only in the books. If you remember, she was engaged to Qi's brother until the Guan family betrayed them and the sisters were exiled along with Jun Huan's father. The sisters have now been allowed back and their parents should be following behind and joining them soon. Yu Rao has been able to keep hold of her youthful optimism, but after all they've been through, Yu Yao has become quiet, glum, and just generally low-spirited. The younger Yu Rao looks very similar to Jun Huan, Yu Yao not as much. On their way home after greeting the Emperor's Dowager, they run into Qi. Qi gives a rude little greeting and Yu Yao is startled when she recognizes her name. Imperial concubine Qi looked confused for a moment, then, after taking a closer look, quickly jumped to understanding. She raised her lips and sneered. The second lady is back. She stared at me intensely as if she wanted to bore holes through me. But then she smiled and said, I have some good news I haven't had a chance to share with the second lady. My brother Guan Xi married five years ago. They've already had two sons and a daughter. My brother has received promotion after promotion and is blessed with a beautiful wife and consort. We really do owe it all to Shu Fei and the second lady. Mid-laugh, Huan Bi pops her in the mouth, yelling at her for being rude with a well-picked line from a poem. Novel Huan Bi is always ready for violence. Jin Huan and Mei Zhuang ignore Qi and start a conversation about how studious Huan Bi has been lately and what a great line she chose just now. They talk for a while as Qi gets more and more irritated. We continue talking and joking, ignoring Imperial concubine Qi completely. After a long time, she couldn't bear it any longer and called out in a loud voice, Shu Fei! Mei Zhuang slowly turned her head and asked doubtfully, Who are you? Imperial concubine Shi was shocked and angry, but she did not dare to talk back. She could only swallow her anger and say, I am the fifth grade imperial noble concubine Shi of Jiao Lu Pavilion. Mei Zhuang is haughty as hell, asking what a hardly ranked little girl is doing interrupting conversation between two highly ranked seniors. I can so see Mei Zhuang doing this. She always had such a naturally confident air about her, especially towards the height of her power. Qi has no choice but to kneel, as Mei Zhuang muses that if something like this had happened to Hua Fei, she would have been beaten bloody. Jin Huan very casually tells Mei Zhuang not to bother herself, and tells Hua Yi to stay behind and have Qi read a book on morality, and slap her if she gets too lax. I had only taken a few steps when I heard Imperial Concubine Qi behind me say angrily, I don't dare object since you want to punish me, but don't be too proud, your highness. The higher you fly, the harder you fall. Do you think your position as Shu Fei is so secure? I turned my head to look at her, laughing despite myself. The stability of my position naturally won't be affected by you. Despite how cool Mei Zhuang and Jun Huan played it, as they walk away, it's clear Qi's words actually did get to Yu Yao, and she starts to fall apart. Jun Huan tries to comfort her, but she runs off. By the time they find her, she's already tried to hang herself. Jin Huan talks to Yu Rao, who admits that after having a man so publicly renege on their engagement, in addition to what happened to her family, Yu Yao pretty much became a pariah. This whole thing was a much bigger deal for her since these were her prime teenage years while Yu Rao was still a child. She's now essentially become an old maid. She's lost her trust in people, and men especially. Yu Rao says Yu Yao cries all the time. They hear a commotion and Yu Yao has woken up, broken a vase, and is now holding a shard to her neck. The people in the palace were so frightened that all they could do was kneel, crying out and kowtowing nonstop. Yu Yao just kept crying, her thin body trembling, but she had no intention of retreating. Red blood dripped between her fingers, snaking down her snow-white arms. It was a ghastly sight. Anguish and pain seized my heart, giving rise to another wave of anger. I shouted out forcefully, Leave her be! If dying can resolve the shame and remorse in her heart, then why stop her? Though all she'll be doing is making her enemies happy and hurting her family, adding even more sins by breaking the hearts of the people who love her. Losing her strength, Yu Yao drops the weapon and falls onto the bed, crying. Jin Huan makes everyone leave so she can talk to Yu Yao alone. Sobbing, Yu Yao admits that there was always a bit of hope in the back of her mind that Guan Xi left her because he didn't have a choice, but now it's obvious he never really meant to marry her. This was an arranged marriage, so Jin Huan didn't realize it, but her sister did actually think herself in love with him. Makes total sense that Jin Huan didn't know what was really going on with her sister because they've seen each other like three times since she entered the palace. Now that Jin Huan understands, she's able to have an actual conversation with her. She finds out that before the engagement, they had been meeting in private and sending private letters, and Yu Yao inadvertently gave him a lot of the details he was able to use to make his accusations so believable, which is a major part of the reason she's been feeling so depressed and guilty these last few years. She finds herself stupid for not seeing through the ruse and blames herself for the downfall of her family. Jun Huan tells her, 
When I watched plays as a child, I would always see a man and a woman growing close over some trivial thing and forming a bond. But I always thought they were just plays. Or perhaps the young lady had never met another man before, so she couldn't distinguish between good and bad, which is why she would always fall so completely. So true, and why I will always judge grown adults who go after teenagers. Little Yuya really brought me to tears here. She's been carrying so much self-hate and guilt all these years on top of having to step up as the oldest child in the family with Jen Huan and Jen Hong gone. She really needed someone to tell her that none of this was her fault, because it really wasn't. Guan Xi clearly came into this planning to use her innocence from the start. Jen Huan gives her the big sister advice that she needs and comforts her as she cries. She's now all the more determined to bring down the Guan family. This actually would have been nice to see in the drama. It doesn't complicate the story too much and adds a bit of color as to why Chi is so gosh darn antagonistic with her. Jun Huan goes to see Jun and she has not been feeling well since her delivery. In the last book, her maid Chi Shao was married to the emperor and is now Rong Xuan Shi. Eager to shake off her public image as Jun's old maid, she goes out of her way to be rude to her old mistress, and Jun has never been much of a fighter. Jun Huan arrives to find Jun overwhelmed by her crying baby. After giving her some parenting advice, she shows her some winter clothes she's picked out for her son. Jin Shi notices a stain on one of the clothes and, recognizing it, realizes that it must have passed through the hands of someone infected with smallpox. Jin Huan realizes this was a plot to make it seem like she wanted Jin's son dead. Jin doesn't doubt her, as it would be ridiculous to plan this and then have her own maid find the stain and ruin her own plan. At the next morning meeting, the Empress asks Jin Huan and Jin to stay behind so they can talk about the joys of child rearing. She breezily says what a happy coincidence it is that Jin Huan was able to save Jin's son from wearing those pox infected clothes. She spoke slowly and deliberately. Isn't that so? When the Ministry of Internal Affairs accidentally sent clothes contaminated with smallpox to the Imperial Concubine's palace, Shu Fei just happened to be there. And Shu Fei just happened to notice the stain on the clothes. It's clear that Shu Fei cares so meticulously for the Imperial Noble Concubine. Jin Huan, of course, notices how she keeps using the word coincidence and not so casually bringing up that they both have sons. She's clearly trying to make Jun suspicious of her. The Empress stands and says in a serious tone, Imperial Noble Concubine Jun, keep vigilant watch of your only son. After saying that, she looked at me deeply and said, You as well, Shu Fei. Subtle. Ling Rong continues to get bullied, but the Empress doesn't defend her, so she starts her crash diet. At a winter banquet, Ling Rong makes her skinny debut, the Emperor loves it, and she's promoted to Zhao Yuan. Huan Bi angrily says they should have killed her when they had the chance, to which Jun Huan responds that she would rather make her life worse than death. Jun Huan and Yu Rao run into Xuan Fen, the Emperor's ninth brother. We have the exact same conversation, sparks flying everywhere, they're super cute. Chen Jin gets hurt and Jen Huan lets Huan Bi go and take care of him. In a situation mirroring Jen Huan's, Hu Zhao Yi, who was just about to be conferred as a consort, gets in trouble for wearing the wrong clothes. In this case, the clothes are said to have a phoenix embroidery on them, a huge crime since that is reserved for the empress. Knowing that she will be blamed since she's in charge of the day-to-day -day harem affairs, Jun Huan makes her way over to the Empress's palace. She enters to find the Empress unhappily clutching the clothing while Hu is just chillin', casually playing with her nail guards. The Empress tells Jun Huan what happened and then kindly tells Hu that she can understand a young woman making a mistake and if she owns up to it and apologizes, she won't go too hard on her. If she doesn't, she will have no choice but to, and here she uses the phrase da yi mian qin, which translates to ignore family relations in the service of justice. The Empress showed both care and reason, but Hu Yunrong remained indifferent, saying lightly, I was personally appointed by the Emperor. Even if your highness intends to sacrifice personal relations for justice, she smiled suddenly, and even the dignified purple she wore was suddenly turned lively and bright by her smile. In terms of relation, the Emperor is both my cousin and my husband so he's naturally closer to me than anyone else. And justice? Your Highness, ask yourself, do you really seek justice in your heart? So even if you wish to sacrifice personal relations for justice, that burden would not fall on you, Your Highness. The Empress's color changes and she comments that Hu reminds her a lot of her old friend Hua Fei. Anyway, Hu is rude as hell and Jen Huan is just watching this brewing storm from the sidelines. The Empress finally has enough and calls in the Emperor. The ears of the palace people were always sharp, and when they heard that the Empress was angry, Consort Chang had overstepped her bounds, and Shu Fei was implicated, they all rushed to Zhao Yang Palace. By the time Xuanling arrived, all the concubines in the harem except the pregnant Mei Zhuang had arrived. Seeing that I remained in a kneeling position, they all hurriedly followed suit. It was completely silent. Only Hu Zhao Yi's petite figure stood proud and lofty, like a flower blooming in the cold. The Empress does her whole helpless martyr act and tells the Emperor she tried to make Hu see reason, but she's just so arrogant. Since Xuanling entered the palace, Hu Yunrong had remained silent with her back turned to him. 
Xuanling had to call her several times before she slowly turned around, and surprisingly, the cold and arrogant expression had been completely erased. Her face was covered with tears and she threw herself into Xuanling's arms with a soft sound, crying so hard she almost choked. Who is really killing me? She really went from, I don't give a f to, husband save me, I don't know what's going on. Though her arrogance still shows even in the middle of her tearful performance as Chi tries to come over and comfort her. With icy superiority, she said, who are you? How dare you touch me? Hilarious. So anyway, the emperor is ready to demote her and take away her daughter. The empress is all like, oh no, oh no, oh yes. Then John points out that looking at the embroidery carefully, the bird is not actually a phoenix, though it resembles one. It's actually another kind of mythical bird. Everyone looks closer and agrees, yeah, that's no phoenix. Xuanling looked at her apologetically. He stretched out his hand to hold Yunrong's. You should have said something earlier. You suffered this grievance for nothing. Hu Yunrong put on a wrong expression with a hint of childish coquettishness. There was no trace of the icy, arrogant expression from earlier. She brushed off the emperor's hand, stamping her foot and saying, Just now, cousin, you were in such a state of agitation. How could I possibly have ventured to make my defense? You're well aware of my disposition. I might have said something rash and upset you. Then you surely would have shunned my company. Everyone's like, well, why the hell didn't you just explain the bird thing to the Empress? But who says she never got a chance to speak? She barely came in and the Empress was already talking about killing her relatives and whatnot. The Empress tells the Empress not to lose her temper like this going forward, which is absolutely ridiculous because the Empress has been nothing but calm for the last two decades. And on nothing but the word of this new girl, the Emperor believes that she Luna. suddenly flipped her top? I'm no friend of the Empress's, but even I'm offended for her. Anyway, who says she had the bird embroidered because, because, well, your majesty, remember that jade I was born with? Look at the back! The emperor has a look and lo and behold, there's a small and very detailed engraving of a pair of mythical birds. Oh my goodness, what an auspicious sign from heaven. The emperor even says the bird symbolizes that she will become a noble consort one day, which has everyone simultaneously rolling their eyes and shaking in their boots. Jun Huan realizes whose ambitions are sky high and for the first time sees a crack in the Empress's armor that did not come from her. The Empress and Jun Huan kneel to ask for punishment for misjudging Hu, everyone else kneels to ask the Emperor to go easy on them. But one person remains standing. She says Jun Huan's crimes in this affair are grave, but they are nothing in comparison to her true crime. That's right baby, it's the affair plot. Totally the same, Qi gets slapped but powers on, the embroidery on one sleeve, the shitty nun Jingbai, Lan Yi leaving to get help, Ninth Prince shows up to defend Jun Huan and actually slaps Qi as well when she insinuates that he might be defending her for less than pure reasons. The blood test goes exactly the same, though we find out later that Huan Bi planned a second layer of protection here. The prince that was brought in was actually second prince, Jun's son, so his blood would have mixed with the emperor's if the emperor had decided to use his own blood. Yu Rao runs in. This was the first time Xuanling had seen Yu Rao. His eyes darkened and he seemed to be in a trance. He whispered softly, Wan. My heart sank and I quickly pulled Yu Rao behind me, signaling at her not to say a word. Mo Yan arrives, though sadly Hua Yi was not there to see her mom be so cool. We have the abused maid. Qi doesn't finger the empress and takes all the blame. She's demoted. Jing Bai and the maid have their tongues removed and the empress is told to retire. Ling Rong goes on about how Dr. Wen will harm Jen Huan one day and then Wen grabs a fruit knife and stabs himself in the crotch right there in front of everyone. He says, this will assure everyone of her highness's innocence and then passes out. All the concubines turn pale with shock and start panicking and running away. Some of the more timid ones have already fainted. And yeah, I imagine this is probably the worst thing they've ever seen. Yu Rao turned around in a panic, and in a flash, Xuan Fen appeared in front of her, covering her eyes with one hand and shouting, Close your eyes, don't look. I turned and saw that Xuan Fen's palm was half an inch away from Yu Rao's eyebrows. He wasn't touching her skin. I was moved that amidst this chaos, he still so scrupulously abided by the rules of etiquette. Hurriedly, I said, Your Majesty, I will have to leave my little sister in your care. He nodded as if he were swearing to something very important. I felt a little relieved and tried my best to suppress the deep pain in my heart. My mind was blank. All I could think was, what if he died? What would I do if he died? But I wonder how much of that is my dear friend Wen Shichu and how much is my important ally Dr. Wen. But anyway, in the midst of all the chaos, Mei Zhuang was at the gate and just like in the drama, she faints. It was Ling Rong's maid who sent the news, Jun Huan slaps her, Ling Rong slaps herself, slaps the maid, and the emperor has the maid beaten to death. Dr. Wen steps up despite his damaged member, Mei Zhuang gives birth to a prince, the fourth prince. She's close to death and this scene plays out just the same, though this is the reveal of where the baby came from. Since we didn't actually see it happen and just had a few hints from Mei Zhuang's behavior, I imagine it must have been quite a surprising reveal for the people just reading the novel. Wen tells her he truly does care for her and she dies. Hu is promoted to consort and becomes Min Fei. I will keep calling her Hu though. 
The Empress Dowager is hurt about losing Mei Zhuang and blames Ling Rong. I love this because the relationship they had for years and years, it was crazy to me how easily the Empress Dowager in the drama just got over it. Mei Zhuang was literally the only woman in the harem who gave a flying fig about her, and I can't imagine the Empress Dowager just taking it so easily. The Emperor stops seeing Ling Rong making this, what, the 12th time Ling Rong loses favor. The Emperor totally waits an appropriate amount of time, not, before he starts flirting with Yu Rao. Yu Rao is not interested. The royal family is hanging out playing archery games one day. Yu Rao does a great job and everyone loves her. Xuan Fen asks if she will let him try to shoot a hairpiece off of her head, and without hesitation she says, hell yeah! He shoots, and everyone flinches except Yu Rao, who stands still and confident as Xuan Fen hits his mark. Why didn't you yell, or try to avoid it? You weren't afraid at all? The corners of Yu Rao's lips raised with a hint of mischievous pride. Would you dare to shoot me? My big sister would not spare you. She lowered her head. Your majesty would not shoot me. Perhaps it was the sunlight, but her cheeks seemed pink with a light blush. You're a very good marksman. Xuan Ling starts to see what's up, but it seems like he wants to stick his head in the sand and marry her anyway. We get the banquet where Huan Bi accidentally spills a drink on Xuan Xing, revealing the paper cutout. Huan Bi says it's her, yada yada. Xuan Xing tries to object, but no dice. Huan Bi joins the Jun family, and they have their sad little goodbye. Xuan Xing marries Jing Xian as well. Huan Bi is renamed Yu Yin. Her parents are finally allowed back into the capital. And Jun Huan finally gets permission to track down and meet with Gu Jiayi, the courtesan that took part in that plot with her brother. Jun Huan sees her for the second time, and she's just as beautiful as she remembered. She does bear a resemblance to Ling Rong, but unlike Ling Rong, she has a stubborn strength about her, a bit of arrogance, and an expression that says she knows how striking she is. Yu Rao and Huan Bi are there as well. She greets Jun Huan, and they actually have a very civil conversation. Jun Huan asks if she's still working at the brothel, and she responds that she is, thanks to certain circumstances. She recounts Jun Hung coming to see her for the first time, paying her a lot of money and telling her about the plan. She knew exactly what she was stepping into, and every bit of it was according to plan. Yu Rao said in a stunned tone, I always thought that the miscarriage was true, that you hated my brother because you lost your child and were not married into the Jun family. How could that be? She lowered her face with a sad expression. Except for the necessary displays, he never even touched me. Even though he was by my side and treated me very well, even though he was completely separated from the young madam, not a day went by that he didn't miss her and his child. A pink blush flashed across her face like a flower slowly blooming. I had never seen such a man. I fell in love with him completely. I began to hope that like the rumors he spread in public, he would actually marry me as his consort. So really, Jun Hong did nothing wrong, was upfront from the start, and she hurt herself with her wishful thinking. He held up his end of the deal and paid to redeem her body, but of course didn't want to marry her. What's the point of having your freedom if you can't be with a man you love? So I returned to Liu Han Pavilion to resume my life of drunken intoxication. So you took your revenge on my family because your love turned to hatred? She shook her head. Your brother simply didn't want me. Why would I hurt him for that? What really made me resentful was something else. Chi's brother Guan Lu came to visit her one day and showed her a painting of Ling Rong. It was then that Jiayi realized that she had been chosen because of her resemblance to her. I was so good to him while I was by his side, but I couldn't compete with some concubine An in a faraway palace? When it was the wholehearted, I love my wife and only my wife thing, she could understand, but to find out that he was using her as a replacement for someone else made it a personal slight. She was angry, but also, Guan Lu told her that the whole Jun family was implicated, and if she didn't do as he said, she would be burned along with possibly her sisters at the Liu Han Pavilion, so part of it was wanting to protect her adopted family. She lowered her head, her earlier cold and arrogant air gradually dissipating. I came from a humble background and I hated being looked down on more than anything, so I made a big mistake out of anger. It wasn't until three years after the incident that I finally understood that so many problems arose from my pride and impulsiveness but the mistake was already made and I had no idea of how to remedy it. Jun Huan thanks her for taking care of her brother, revealing she knows she's been visiting him. Jiayi says she truly is apologetic and is willing to confess to whatever she needs. Jun Huan asks if she would be willing to write these things down, and without hesitation, Jiayi pricks her finger with a hairpin and begins writing out the letter in blood. She finishes it and says, I only dared to visit the young master because I knew that he couldn't recognize me. Now that the young master is getting better, I'm ashamed to face him. How can I dare to see him again? Once this is over, I will leave and not embarrass him. She bowed deeply. I hope this can make amends for the mistakes I made in the past. I was really gearing up for Jiayi to be the big bad guy we had to defeat, but nope. She was just kind of caught up in all this mess and she seems truly repentant. So, okay, bye I guess. A few days later, Shen Ling uses this and other evidence he's been collecting for years to bring the Guan family down. Like with Hua's family, he often knows which families are corrupt, but he has to wait for the most opportune moment. 
Their homes were confiscated and they were exiled and imprisoned. All the adult men were cut in half. Boys under the age of 14 were exiled to western Xinjiang. Their wives and daughters were sold into servitude. When Guanlu heard the news, he committed suicide in prison in despair. Chi is demoted to a commoner and, like in the drama, cries and begs in the rain until she is killed. Zhen Huan gives the news to Yu Yao, and she doesn't have much of a reaction until Zhen Huan pulls out a ring she had given to Guan Xi when he was courting her. Yu Yao freaks out, crying and begging to see him one more time, saying this proves he actually did love her. He kept her ring all these years. They have to physically restrain her, and finally, Huan Bi explains that, no, this ring was not kept by Guan Xi, but was taken off of one of his consorts. Yu Yao held the ring tightly as if she wanted to crush it in her hand. Sister, did you really take this from another woman's hand? Yu Yin sighed. Miss Liu was his eighth concubine. She held Yu Yao's hand. Sister, he's really not worth it. After a long time, Yu Yao made a soft, oh. Her voice was as thin as mist. I will never think of this person again. Her voice was so soft, as if she were not in this world, and yet so decisive. After speaking, she turned and went towards the inner room. Her steps were shaky, and like a wisp of smoke, she disappeared behind the screen. Yu Yao turns to religion, spending day and night praying and barely speaking. Jun Huan thinks to herself that it seems like Yu Yao's world has had all the color taken out of it, and in an attempt to not feel any pain, she has hidden her heart away. All she can do is support her while she tries to find her way out of that darkness. Ling Rong regains favor and then loses it once again when her father gets in trouble. Zhen Huan with that gloating little rat comment. Zhen Huan is on a deadline to get Yu Rao married as not only does the emperor want her, the empress dowager is also worried about the emperor's infatuation and wants to marry Yu Rao off to some random faraway lord. Zhen Huan does that thing where they accidentally run into Xuan Fen and Yu Rao, same conversation here, as well as the same conversation between the emperor and Yu Rao. The emperor allows them to get married. Ling Rong is suddenly revealed to be four months pregnant. She becomes a consort, Li Fei. Zhen Huan pushes for some promotions and we get Duan becoming the noble consort, Gui Fei, and Jing getting a promotion to De Fei. For consorts, we have Xin Fei, the first princess's mother, Zhen Fei, the second prince's mother, Li Fei, Ling Rong, and Min Fei, Hu, the fourth princess's mother. But it isn't long until Hu is promoted again. The emperor just adores her. Quick aside, there are over 50 concubines in these novels and half of them have like one line before they disappear, which is why you're only seeing the important ones. I totally get that it builds the world, but the amount of times I've been reading only to get to a name mid-sentence and go who, and then pour through my notes and find it some irrelevant 15 year old with no backstory, and their names change like every week. Ling Rong tries to get on the Empress Dowager's good side, hoping to elicit sympathy by standing outside with her pregnant self, but the Empress Dowager just leaves her standing outside in the cold. Which again, I love. Good to see someone else standing up for Mei Zhuang. The Emperor has literally already forgotten she existed. Zhen Huan's doctor tells her that Ling Rong's baby is definitely not coming out. They find out about the aphrodisiac, there's a plot with the flowers. Ling Rong has the miscarriage thanks to the Emperor not being able to control himself. He promotes her to assuage his guilt. The Empress Dowager could not care less and doesn't even want the other consorts mourning, saying, It's not as if Li Fei is the first woman in the harem to have a miscarriage. Then it comes out about Ling Rong using the aphrodisiac on the Emperor. Zhen Huan puts that final nail in the coffin with her musky scratch ointment, and Ling Rong is called in. She gets slapped in the face with a thin wooden board, losing two of her teeth. Then, in front of everyone, she gives that same final speech, including my favorite line of hers. She's allowed to live, but is grounded in her palace. Her father is sentenced to death. As things settle down, Zhen Huan gets a very welcome surprise visitor. A man in blue slowly came into sight, gathered his clothes, and bowed. Your Highness, Shu Fei. The familiar voice, like the plucking of a string, stirred a long-lost sense of warmth and kinship within me. I hurried forward to help him to a chair. I tried to speak, but tears fell first, and I cried softly, Brother, are you feeling better? He is doing much better since Zhen Huan arranged proper care for him, and he gets to meet his niece and nephew for the first time. He tells her what happened. When he was exiled, he still thought his family was safe. When the news was brought to him that his wife and son were dead, he just couldn't face it, and it broke him. It was a long road to recovery, but he's made his peace with it now. Before he goes, he asks to meet with Ling Rong. She requested almonds, so he brings them in with him when he goes to talk to her in private as Zhen Huan waits outside. When he comes out, Zhen Huan wants to know what they talked about, but he says, It's nothing. It's all in the past. She really is so pitiful. Then we get the news that Ling Rong is dead. Ling Rong's final words are not included in the novel, so kudos to the writers for coming up with that whole final conversation because it was great. Zhen Hong doesn't react much, but when he looks away, Zhen Huan thinks she sees tears in his eyes. I was stunned for a moment. She was dead. 
An Ling Rong was dead. I suddenly started laughing. I couldn't stop, surprising even myself that such carefree, hearty laughter had burst from my throat. My ears still rung with the sound of Mei Zhuang and I laughing back then. Ling Rong, sweet and timid, too shy to speak up. After more than 10 years, finally, the love, the hate, it all left my body. How lonesome, how quiet. One more book. Till next time, thanks for watching.